uh, I want to thank Brian and Nate and, and of course the sponsors for giving me talk. Uh, uh, this is like, I, I think the first presentation I've done back in Nebraska since I uh, finished my PhD at the University of Nebraska. So i uh, super excited to, uh, to check back in. Um, so uh, I am a, a, a user experience researcher by training. Uh, I lead a team at Google working on Google hardware. If you're familiar with our phones, our Pixel phones, our Google Nest products, I lead researchers to help make those uh, user-friendly, ergonomic, and easy to use. Uh, I'm also uh, 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 legally blind, uh, so I have low vision. So uh, accessibility and then now uh, extending that to inclusive design has been something that's near and dear to my heart. So I lead a, a, also an initiative at Google called Inclusive Design. So my talk today is about uh, making a case for uh, inclusive design and how yeah, to maybe inspire you to go out and, uh, and start to explore it and practice it in your work, whether you're doing a physical hardware product or a digital product that actually works in certain ways even uh, more seamlessly for uh, digital solutions. Um, Brian, if you go to the next slide. Um, as you know, I, I've been slowly losing my vision for a number of years and it, it really started affecting me during my grad school. Uh, but I've also, my hobby has been art and I started painting with limited vision. And every few years I learned to readapt with my current vision and learn to repaint. So. It's really about adaptation and uh, adaption for people with disabilities. And that's something really powerful for us to understand and put into our designs. Uh, Brian, if you can click on the, the, the image, uh, there's a short little video about me as a painter. Um, I think we're having troubles showing that, buddy. Okay. Okay. No worries. Uh, you know, if, 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 at the end, if someone wants to say, uh, say the email, I can send them a link to the, to the little video. Okay. No worries. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So uh, I, I wanted to start with the definition of uh, disability. It's not what you might think. The World Health Organization describes it as the uh, the features of a person's body in context with their environment. That doesn't, uh, what that means is that it's a dynamic interaction between a person's capabilities in the moment and their environment. So uh, when you are, uh, uh, when you are outside and looking at your phone in bright sunlight, you have trouble seeing it. Now I have trouble seeing it, whether it's bright or dark, but uh, so it's a way to have a more dynamic and social model of disability. So uh, what the World Health Organization estimates is that about 15%, about a billion people, the world population have some form of disability. And you know, up to two to 5% have really severe limitations that really impact them. It's, it, it tends to affect, uh, sadly, women more than men. Uh, uh, you know, uh, historically marginalized groups more than others. And, uh, and it's also affected by access to medical attention and socioeconomic wealth. So uh, it, it's really imperative that we, uh, you know, design our products and services for, uh, uh, you know, people with disabilities in mind. Okay, if you go on to the next slide. So what does that mean? It, 
what it means is that we want to give a diverse way of, uh, of experiencing the product so everyone has a sense of belonging. And this is a definition by Susan Goldsmith I like. So what we wanna consider is we wanna consider uh, you know, aspects of ability, which is like uh, you know, vision, uh, hearing, uh, mobility, uh, cognition, and uh, uh, those are the typical ones we think about when we think about accessibility. It's when you, you, uh, uh, you know, work on your products and services and follow accessibility standards. But then you interlace things like someone's aspects of their identity, their race, language, age, culture, uh, age, and other forms of human difference. And uh, that's really uh, an interesting uh, approach that makes things uh, inclusive beyond uh, accessibility. Uh, go on to the next slide. So uh, you might have heard of universal design. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you know, both universal design and inclusive design do want to, you know, provide as you know ways for everyone to participate in the process. Well, the difference is, is that universal design usually has one design that they, that they hope will you know, uh, you know, uh, serve as many people as possible. Okay, whereas in, what what inclusive design does that's different is it looks at who might be excluded from the design, comes up with a solution for their people, and then apply, and then applies it to other people to benefit everyone. Okay. If we go on to the next slide, uh, you, uh, you know, again, many of you probably work in uh, accessibility and do accessibility in your uh, in, in your work. Uh, you know, those are a set of uh, predefined uh, you know standards and guidelines uh, you know developed by uh, consortiums and uh, organizations, and they help to to ensure that that you know products are meeting uh, you know. Because this is standards to use basically assistive technology for those uh, uh, for those accessibility uh, uh, but for those accessibility things that I talked about earlier, like you know vision, hearing, mobility, and cognition. Okay, but what uh, but what uh, inclusive design does is that we want to start with solving a problem. Uh, for one person and then trying to give it extend it to the many and give as many different ways to do it. Inclusive design is more of a process that builds on top of, you may have heard of, uh, of, uh, of user-centered design, to have, uh, to have those needs considered up front and to involve uh, people uh, who have those needs in your design process. Okay. Um, if we go on to the next slide, uh, Brian, which slide am I on? Just to I lose my place sometimes. Inclusive design leads to innovation. Okay, all right. Well, uh, in, in inclusive design leads to uh, you know innovation. It uh, uh, you know the remote control you use every day, the voice assistants you use in your car or on speakers around the home or on your phone and even the keyboard shortcuts that you might use to uh, in the computer. Uh, did you know that all of those were invented for some, uh, to help someone with a mobility and, and, and paralysis issue, okay? You know, could you imagine if you lost your remote or the batteries are out, uh, having to get up to change the channel uh, and they're not even on the front of the TVs anymore, on the back of the TV. Okay, so uh, you, you know uh, when you design for the one and extend the many, you know you you often come up with something that is uh, revolutionary, not just evolutionary. Okay, uh, next slide. It's a placeholder slide, and you know as I I've put some of my paintings in the. Uh, in the laser sites. Uh, if we go on to the next one, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, uh, you know, how we're approaching it at Google. We, we started by coming up with these five principles. One is we wanna embrace human differences uh, to make things better for everyone. We really want 
to uh, uh, focus on what people can do, not what they can't do. And we, we, we want to study the uh, physical, uh, social, and cultural context of the, of, of the, the uh, experiences and situations and um, environments that people are in when they're using our products and services. And we want to provide, again, that diversity or uh, choices, as many choices as possible, to allow uh, as many people to participate in Google's products and services as possible. And then we want to have the humility to, um, uh, to really kind of not just you know, put our heads in the sand and ignore that we might be excluding folks. We may not be able to, shall we say, address it in our current version of the product, but we don't want to ignore it. Because if we, if we just stick our heads down and ignore things, we are probably, you know, we are going to be running the risk of exclusion by uh, unintended consequences or accidental design. And that's not uh, you know, a, a good thing for us or, or, or any company to be doing. Okay, if you go on to the next slide, so I want to convince you that it's really for everyone, that you, we can design for the one and apply to the many. So think about situations in your daily life. In a car, your, uh, your hands are busy, uh, you know, uh, uh, driving on the wheel, you're in a constrained mobile space. Uh, your eyes are not able to look at tech or technology. You have to keep your eyes on the road. Uh, when you are tired at night, your brain is not working very well. My brain certainly doesn't work well at, at night, um, and uh, and your eyes may be tired. Okay, when you are holding a baby uh, in your hand or a bag of groceries, you only have one hand to use. When you are, uh, you know, if, if if you're working out and you have an injury to one hand that temporarily for a few weeks, you have less use of that hand. So there are everyday situations that, uh, you know, people don't have uh, uh, that, that, uh, that a solution that we come up with, with for people with permanent disabilities may be able to help them. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, yeah, this is the framework we come up with that really helped us figure it all out. So uh, we came up with this idea in hardware of everyday interactions. So we started with the idea that, you know, with the areas of, of uh, 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 vision, hearing, speech, uh, and uh, mobility, and cognition. And we then said, okay, uh, uh, we said, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we have subcategories of those called partial or just no ability. So yeah, if, if for vision, if something needs to be eyes free, that means then the task needs to be, be able to do without looking at anything and doing it all through, you know, audio, right? Uh, if something is, uh, uh, and if it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, for mobility, uh, you know, for partial mobility, we consider, well, if someone can do things one-handed or with very limited dexterity, that's an example of a, a, a partial hands-free. So, so uh, and with hearing, you know, you know, something with uh, what we consider partial hearing is something that you can do uh, when, you, when you've lost some hearing or possibly when you're in a very noisy environment. Uh, okay, so, uh, and, and on top of that, we've interlaced the, the cultural dimensions, the uh, race, ethnicity, gender, age, because, you know, some of those factors actually really impact some of those ability ones. Um, you know, when uh, age is a great example of this, uh, you know, little children grow into their bodies and, and learn to walk and learn uh, dexterity and things, uh, and you know, 
And of course they learn, you know, they learn cognitively, they learn to read. At the beginning, they don't know how to read, just look at images, right? Uh, and then, you know, when you get, uh, when you age or get older, you start to, you know, uh, then just to, you know, have mild lo losses of senses. And uh, it's, it's typically more than one at a time. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, so uh, these are factors that are also very important to us. And someone's culture, where they live and how they view things is also really important to include in inclusive design. Okay, so we go on to the next slide. So, uh, the, the, so, you know, what I would encourage you to do is to, you know, is to start with your products and services and, you know, take whatever user data you have and say, okay, with my design and people in the room, you know, who might, who, who might have trouble using this? Who might have difficulty and what are those potential reasons why, okay? Uh, if you don't have data, for this and you have good hunches, it's okay. Um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, if it's easy to go ahead and fix and take care of that, then you may want to act on your hunches. But if not, then I would go out and collect data to really understand this the problem and go, go talk to folks who are in this group and really understand the, the concerns. Um, and you know, uh, gathering using user research and gathering needs is really important. Um, with with at least inclusive design, if you really kind of understand the workarounds that disabled people have, and if you go through a process of having them help you design a solution, now they're not going to replace designers. They're not professional designers. But what happens is when you engage them uh, in the task of designing something just customized for them, you'll start to you'll start to understand what works well for them and that, and then combine all the different ways that all the individuals wanted to do it into a coherent design as a designer. Uh, so uh, would really encourage you to to use co-design, and really don't don't get paralyzed that. It's too much. I can't do it all. I can't make all I've heard is it. Just start with one or two things, career version, because the, the, the great thing, I think most of the people on this call work on software. The great thing is that you know you can iteratively continually improve things, right? So uh, you know, focus on worry about what you can do, not what you can do, even in terms of the process. Okay. Uh, because I think it 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 will make things better for everyone. And really also to get buy-in from leadership, uh, you know, we often you know, try to uh, pick something that uh, is our first candidates are things that uh, you know, we have a path to doing and doing it successfully and solving the inclusion problem. But then it also has some tangible uh, benefit uh, for others to then get that buy-in uh, from senior leadership to go forward. Uh, next slide, I think are on myths. So, you know, we, we run into all these myths uh, and uh, yeah, even at Google, we still run into all these myths and uh, and, and I think you run into them that people will say, oh, inclusive design, accessibility, things like that. Oh, it costs too much. It takes too much time. I don't have, it, uh, it takes too many resources. It's not part of our process and culture. It's too hard to put in. It's gonna make the design ugly. Um, it's gonna slow down the performance, right? Okay, so we've we've you know kind of heard that all uh, before. Okay, um, that's really though. These are really these are real myths. If you know, if you really work in apply inclusive design, these can be overcome. Okay. Uh, the next slide is a placeholder. So now I'm going to tell a quick little story on uh, how email was invented. If you go on the next slide, you see a picture of Vince. Uh, Vince Cerf is the the chief technical evangelist at Google. He is one of the co-founders of you know co-inventors of the internet uh, when he was at MCI and. Other days, he 
led a team that defined the networking standards and uh, you know uh, TCIP is you know, you know one of his uh, co-inventions um, with his team and uh, uh, if you go on to the next slide uh, I, I don't know how many people know about Vint uh, he uh, he has partial hearing he wears a hearing aid and his wife uh, up until recently was fully deaf. I think she used this cochlear in, uh, some implants now and has some hearing. But, uh, you know, in the 70s, he needed a way to communicate with her, you know. Uh, uh, so, you know, because he's been surf and he's a genius, he just, you know, advanced email, right? So, uh, uh, so because he did, you know, he wants a text way to communicate with his wife over the protocol network that he can do over a phone line, and uh, he just invents email. And when he went through the process of inventing it, his wife actually didn't adapt to it. She's more of a really person, but everyone in the tech world did because they wanted asynchronous communication. They wanted a record, and so it was one where uh, uh, it, it, it's one of the it's one of the greatest examples of something that. If we didn't design for the one and extent the many, uh, it yeah, I think we would eventually had email and messaging, but we may not have had it at, at, as early as we did. Okay. Um, so if you go on to the, uh, the next slide, so yeah, uh, Vint being technical evangelist, he, he his manifesto here, uh, his rant is it ought to be criminal basically for developers and designers not to consider accessibility at the beginning of a process and not make it an afterthought. So, and, and why I'm advocating for inclusive design is that it's arguably the best way in user-centered design to consider it in the beginning of the process. So I think my last slide is a thank you and uh, please reach out if you have any questions, there's my Google email, or you can look me up on LinkedIn. And uh, I just want to thank you for uh, listening. I don't think so, yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, that was some really great stuff. Um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to Vince or talk, I would highly recommend looking it up online. Um, yeah, that concludes our 2021 uh, Connect Ha. Thanks for putting up with um, all Thanks. of our hey, I, have yeah. a, I, I do have a quick humbling story about how oh. I screwed up with oh. Vince Surf. Just okay. because you will screw up when you do inclusive stuff. So Vince was one of our sponsors for inclusive hardware. And uh, one of my team members, uh, you, you saw that slide on... Uh, on um, the the, uh, the the framework, one when, when of my team members had an iChart version with not good contract. In the middle of our sponsorship presentation, he just starts ripping us. <laughs> okay, and we just humbly said, "You guys are doing leading society program, and you make this yeah, chart." And, I, he, and then and then my uh, uh, you know my, my my team member said, "I." really embarrassed and he goes you ought to be embarrassed and we were and then i just uh, afterwards i regrouped the team and i said okay we need to just you know not follow the the uh, our standard designers templates we need to use the accessible ones we went to our central accessibility team and got one with less you know more contrast and they and we just move forward but so but please don't paralyze that you will there will be mistakes along the way right but just, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I've been ripped by the inventor of the internet. I'm still standing. <laughs> <laughs>